Baker Hawks. It's Mrs. R. I've moved upstairs in my house and went to a different bookshelf just for fun. No surprise that Mrs. R. has a lot of bookshelves in her house, right? So where are we? We're reading Flora and Ulysses and we are at chapter 26. Spies don't cry. Let's see how far we can get today. Flora's father was a careful driver. He kept his left hand at 10 o'clock on the steering wheel and his right hand at 2. He never took his eyes off the road. He did not go fast. Speed, her father often said, this is what will kill you. That and taking your eyes off the road. Never ever take your eyes off the road. Pop, said Flora, I need to talk to you. Okay, said her father. He kept his eyes on the road. About what? The sack and the shovel. What sack, said her father, what shovel? It occurred to Flora that her father would make an excellent spy. He never really answered questions. Instead, when asked a question, he simply responded with a nifty sidestep or a question of his own. For instance, when her parents were getting their divorce, Flora had this conversation with her father that went something like this. Flora, are you and mom getting divorced? Flora's father, who says we're getting divorced? Flora, mom, Flora's father, is that what she said? Flora, that's what she said, Flora's father. I wonder why she said that. And then he started to cry. Spies probably didn't cry, but still, there's a sack and a shovel in the trunk of the car, Pop, said Flora. Is there, said her father. I saw you put them in there. It's true, I did put a sack and a shovel in the trunk of the car. The criminal element said that it was a good idea to engage in relentless, open-ended questioning. If you question with enough ferocity, people are sometimes surprised into answering questions that they do not intend to answer. When in doubt, question. Question more, question fast. Why, said Flora. I intend to dig a hole, said her father. For what, said Flora, a thing that I'm going to bury. What thing are you going to bury? A sack. Why are you burying a sack? Because your mother asked me to. Why did she ask you to bury a sack? Her father tapped his fingers on the steering wheel. He stared straight ahead. Why did she ask me to bury a sack? Why did she ask me to bury a sack? That's a good one. Hey, I know. Do you want to get something to eat? What, said Flora. How about some lunch, said her father. For the love of Pete, said Flora. Or some breakfast. How about we stop and eat a meal? My meal. Any meal. Flora sighed. The criminal element advised stalling, delaying, and obfuscation of every possible sort when it came to dealing with a criminal. Her father wasn't a criminal, not exactly, but he had been enlisted in the service a villain. Basically, he was in cahoots with an arch nemesis, so maybe it was a good idea to stall and delay the inevitable showdown by going into a restaurant. Besides, Squirrel was hungry and he would need to be strong for the battle ahead. Okay, said Flora. Okay, sure, let's eat. Chapter 27, the world in all of its smelly glory. Okay, sure, let's eat. What wonderful words those are, I thought of Ulysses. Let's eat talk about poetry, the squirrel was happy. He was happy because he was with Flora. He was happy because he had the words from Tootie's poem flowing through his head and heart. He was happy because he was going to be fed soon. And he was happy because he was well happy. He climbed out of the shoebox and put his front paws on the door and his nose out the window. He was a squirrel riding in a car on a summer day with someone he loved. His whiskers and nose were in the breeze and there were so many smells. Overflowing trash cans, just cut grass, sun -ward patches of pavement, the loomy richness of dirt, earthworms to distinguish from the smell of dirt, dog, more dog, dog again, oh dog, small dogs, large dogs, foolish dogs, the torturing of dogs was the one reliable pleasure of a squirrel's existence. A tang of fertilizer, a faint whiff of bird seed, something baking, the hidden hint of nuttiness, pecan, acorn, the smell, apologetic, don't mind the odor of a mouse, and the ruthless stench of cat. Cats were terrible. Cats were never to be trusted. Never. The world, in all of its smelly glory, and all of its treachery and joy and nuttiness, washed over Ulysses, ran through him, filled him. He could smell everything. He could even smell the blue of the sky. He wanted to capture it. He wanted to write it down. He wanted to tell Flora. He wanted. He turned and looked at her. Keep your eyes open for Maleficent, she said to him. Ulysses nodded. The words from Tootie's poem sounded in his head. Flare up like flame. Yes, he thought. That's what I'll do. I'll flare up like flame and I'll write it all down. Chapter 28. The Giant Donut. You'll have to leave the squirrel in the car, said Flora's father, and he pulled into the parking lot of the Giant Donut. No, said Flora. It's too hot. I'll leave the windows down, said her father. Someone will steal him, said Flora. You think someone would steal him? Her father sounded doubtful, but hopeful. Who would steal a squirrel? A criminal, said Flora. The human heart is a deep, dark river with hidden currents, Flora said to her father. Criminals are everywhere. He, her father tapped his fingers on the steering wheel. I wish I could disagree with you, but I can't. Ulysses sneezed. Bless you, said her father. I'm not leaving him, said Flora. Alfred T. Slipper took his parakeet Dolores with him everywhere, sometimes even to the offices of the 
how to talk at life insurance company. Not without my parakeet. That's what Alfred said. Not without my squirrels, said Flora. If her father recognized the sentence, if the words reminded him of a time together reading about incandesto, he didn't show it. He merely sighed. Bring him in, men, he said, but keep the lid on the shoebox. Ulysses climbed into the shoebox and Flora dutifully lowered the lid on his small face. Okay, she said, all right. She climbed out of the car and then she stood and looked up at the giant donut sign. Giant donuts inside, the sign screamed in neon letters, while an extremely large donut disappeared over and over again into a cup of coffee. But there was no hand on the donut. Who, Flora wondered, is doing the, dink the dunking? A small shiver ran down her spine. What if all donuts were just waiting to be dunked? she thought. It was the kind of question that Wil William Spiver would ask. She could hear him asking it. It was also the kind of question that William Spiver would have an answer for. That was the thing about William Spiver. He always had an answer, even if it was an annoying one. Listen to me, she whispered to the shoebox. You're not a donut waiting to be dunked. You're a superhero. Do not let yourself be tricked and fooled. Remember the shovel. Keep an eye on George Buckman. Her father got out of the car. He put his hands on his pockets and jingled his change. Shall we, he said. Stall, delay, obfuscate. Let's, said Flora. And there's a picture of the giant donut being dunked, right? The sign and flora below it. Chapter 29, Coochie Coo. The giant donuts smelled like fried eggs and donuts at other people's closets. The dining room was full of laughter and donut dunking. A waitress sat Flora and her father at a booth in the corner and handed them a glossy, enormous menu. Flora, surreptitiously, removed the lid from the shoe box. Ulysses poked his head out and looked around the restaurant, and then he turned his attention to the menu. He stared at it with a dreamy look on his face. Get whatever you want, said Flora's father. Order your heart's desire. Ulysses emitted a happy sigh. Pay attention, whispered Flora. A waitress came and stood over them. She tapped her pencil on the order pad. What can I get you, she said. Her name tag spelled out her name in all capital letters. Rita! Flora narrowed her eyes. The exclamation point at the end of Rita's name tag made her seem untrustworthy, or at the very least, insincere. Well, said Rita, what's it going to be? Her hair was piled up very, very high on her head. She looked like Marie Antoinette. Not that Flora had ever seen Marie Antoinette, but she had read about her in terrible things that can happen to you. An issue on the French Revolution, Marie Antoinette, from the little bit that Flora knew about her, would have made a very bad waitress. Flora suddenly remembered that she had a squirrel in her lap. She tapped Ulysses on the head again. Lie low, she whispered to him, but be prepared. She arranged the washcloth so that he was almost completely hidden. What you got there, said Rita. Where, said Flora. In the box. Got a baby doll in the box? Are you talking to your baby doll? Talking to my baby doll, said Flora. She felt a flush of outrage crawl up her cheeks. For the love of Pete. She was 10 years old, almost 11. She knew how to administer CPR. She knew how to outwit her arch and nemesis. She was acquainted with the profound importance of seal blubber. She was a sidekick to a superhero, plus she was a cynic. What self-respecting cynic would carry on a doll in a shoebox? I do not, said Flora, have a baby doll. Let me see her, said Rita. Don't be shy. She bent over, her big bear Marie Antoinette hair scraped against Flora's cheek. No, said Flora. George Buckman, said Flora's father in a worried voice. How do you do? Coochie coo, said Rita. Flora felt a pointed, very specific sense of doom. Rita poked her pencil into the shoebox slowly, slowly. She pushed the washcloth around slowly, and the washcloth, oh, so slowly, fell back and revealed Ulysses' whiskered face. George Buckman, said her father in a much louder voice, how do you do? Rita screamed a long and impossibly loud scream. Ulysses screamed in return, and he leaped from the shoebox. At this point, things proceeded at such a leisurely pace, the squirrel was airborne, and time swung back into action with a vengeance. At last, thought Flora, it's incandesto time. Chapter 30, Sunny Side Up. He had never been so frightened in his life, never. The woman's face was monstrous, her hair was monstrous, and the word on her name tag, Rita, exclamation point, appeared monstrous to him too. Be calm, he told himself as she poked her pencil around. He held himself as still as he could, but then Rita screamed, and it absolutely was impossible not to answer her long piercing shriek with a piercing shriek of his own. She screamed, he screamed, and then everyone, 
of his animal instincts kicked in. He acted without thinking. He tried to escape. He leaped from the box and ended up somehow exactly where he did not want to be in the middle of the monster's hair. Rita jumped up and down. She put her hand to her head and swatted and clawed, trying to dislodge him. The harder she hit, the higher he jumped. The more fiercely the squirrel clung. In this way, Rita and Ulysses danced together around the giant donut. What's happening? Someone asked. Her hair is on fire, someone answered. No, no, something's in her hair, another person said, and it's alive. Ah! Ah, screamed Rita, help me. How, Ulysses wondered, had things gone so wrong? Only moments ago, he had been looking at the giant donut menu captivated by the glossy pictures of food and the dazzling descriptions that accompanied the pictures. There were giant donuts with sprinkles, giant donuts powdered ice, giant donuts filled with things, jelly, cream, chocolate. He had never had a giant donut. Actually, he had never had any kind of donut. They looked delicious, all of them. How was a squirrel to choose? And to complicate matters, there were eggs scrambled, poached over easy sides. Sunny side up, sunny side up, thought Ulysses as he clung to Rita's hair. What a wonderful phrase. A man emerged from the kitchen. He had a, a gigantic white hat on, and he was holding something metal that flashed in the overhead lights of the giant donut. It was a knife. Help me, screamed Rita. And me, thought Ulysses. Help me too. But he was quite certain that the man with the knife had no intention of helping him. Here's a picture of Rita's hair and Ulysses. And then he heard Flora's voice. He couldn't see her because Rita was now spinning around and everything in the restaurant had become somewhat blurred. All the faces became one face. All the screams had become one scream. But Flora's voice stood out. It was the voice of the person he loved. He concentrated on her words. He worked to understand her. Ulysses, she shouted. Ulysses, remember who you are. Remember who he was? Who was he? As if Flora had heard his unspoken question, she answered, you're Ulysses. That's right, he thought I am. Act shouted Flora. That was good advice. Flora was absolutely right. He was Ulysses and he must act. The man with the knife stepped toward Rita. Ulysses loosened his hold on her hair. He leaped again. This time he leaped with purpose and intent. He leaped with all his strength. He flew. Chapter 31. Holy unanticipated occurrences. Flora watched Ulysses fly over her. His tail extended at full length and his front paws delicately pointed. It was like her dream. He looked incredibly, undeniably heroic. Holy Bagumba, said Flora. She climbed on top of the booth so that she had a better view. With when Incandesto flew, when he became a brilliant streak of light in the darkness of the world, he was usually headed somewhere to save something, someone. And Dolores was always flying at his side, offering advice, encouragement, and wisdom. Flora wasn't sure exactly what Ulysses was doing, and it didn't look like he knew either, but he was flying. George Buckman, said her father. How do you do? Flora had forgotten about her father. He was looking up at Ulysses, and he was smiling. It wasn't a sad smile. It was a happy smile. Pop, said Flora. There was a long, loud scream from Rita. It was in my hair, she shouted. Someone threw a donut at Ulysses. A baby started to cry. Flora climbed out of the booth so that she could stand next to her father. She slipped her hand into his. Holy unanticipated occurrences, said Flora's father, in the voice of Dolores. It had been a long time since Flora had heard her father say those words. His name is Ulysses, she told him. Her father looked at her, who raised his eyebrows. Ulysses, he said. He shook his head, and then he laughed. It was a single syllable, ha, and they laughed longer, ha, ha, ha. Flora's heart opened inside of her. Do not hope, she whispered to it. And then she noticed that the cook was leaping and twirling, waving his knife and trying to reach the flying squirrel. She looked right up at her father. She said, this maleficence must be stopped, right? Right, said her father. And since her father agreed with her, Flora stuck out her foot and tripped the man with the knife. Chapter 32, Sprinkles. You have a picture of Ulysses flying. It says, I love Flora. It was in my hair, said Rita the waitress. And then you have Flora looking up and the knife, sunny side up. And then in the last picture, you have Ulysses hitting a window. Splat is the word. Do you guys see it? I flew, thinks Ulysses. Where's Flora? Is that a piece of donut? Sprinkles. There's sprinkles in the air. And Ulysses kind of turns and looks. I think I'm going to stop there and then we'll continue with chapter 33. Um, Huffaker Hawks, this is my last week at Huffaker. Mrs. Perez is going to return next week. So we are almost halfway through with Ulysses and Flora, or Flora and Ulysses. 
I don't think I'll be able to finish all the chapters with you, but I will leave a link down below to the Washoe County Library where your parents can check out, virtually check out, so you can read it on a computer, a tablet, your phone, um, the book for you. And then, of course, Mrs. Perez has it on her shelf at the Huffaker Library when you guys come back. For parents that might be um, watching, this did win a Newbery Award, so it's a very acclaimed book by a very beloved author. Anyway, I'll see you, I'll return one more time this week to read a few more chapters. Have a great week.